T. Boone Pickens has always been a man in motion. From his childhood onwards, he has shown a remarkable ability to identify important goals and achieve them at levels no one else had imagined. And he shows an equally remarkable ability to constantly grow and adapt to a changing world. In 1954, he founded Mesa Petroleum with $2,500, and with his extraordinary optimism and daring, he soon grew it into America's largest independent oil and gas company. Then in 1997, when many people might have gladly retired, he went on to found BP Capital Management, which became the nation's most successful energy-oriented investment fund, and please note that the BP stands for Boone Pickens, not that other BP. <laughs> it's a company with an unrivaled ability to anticipate future energy trends. Mr. Pickens has been repeatedly praised as one of the most effective CEOs of all time, and indeed in 1989 was picked by Financial World as the CEO of the decade. Now for all these reasons, Mr. Pickens has enormous credibility in thinking about our nation's energy future. In 2008, he launched the Pickens Plan, a bold initiative to reduce our dependence on foreign oil, in particular OPEC oil. He's shown how we could reduce that dependence by 30% in 10 years by using our abundant assets in natural gas and wind. And he spent more than $80 million of his own money promoting that plan. His proposal has received support from truly the widest spectrum of political figures imaginable, ranging from the president of the Sierra Club to President Obama to Mark Sanford, former governor of South Carolina. And almost two million U.S. citizens have signed up as supporters. And perhaps more important to many here in this room, his plan was recently very well received on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. It is therefore really no surprise that in 2009, because of his forceful advocacy for this energy program, he was picked by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Now as a nation, we all need to recognize the urgency of confronting our current energy situation and planning for the future. And we all owe an enormous debt to Mr. Pickens for putting forth a highly concrete and creative proposal that is both green and feasible. In addition, it's a plan that could radically transform international relations so that we are no longer feel compelled to make distasteful alliances with other countries because of our addiction to foreign oil. Mr. Pickens has offered us a way forward that raises the very real question of why aren't we acting more forcibly right now to address this crisis? And yet, there's a whole other side of Mr. Pickens of equal impact, namely as a philanthropist. He has repeatedly been recognized as one of the most important philanthropists in the world, with breathtaking donations to educational programs, to health and medical research and services, to athletics and corporate wellness, to the entrepreneurial process, to at-risk youth, and to conservation and wildlife initiatives. He's consistently made a difference in ways that most of us can hardly imagine and he continues to do so on a daily basis. So we're therefore honored to have T. Boone Pickens as our Gordon Grant Fellow, and we're eager to hear, to hear how this person of boundless personal energy will help us understand how to solve our national energy problems. Please join me in welcoming you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Boone, I thought we'd start off by having you talk for about five minutes about your plan and then turn this over to a conversation because I know people want to have a back and forth. Okay, I'm going to ask my daughter sitting on the front row when I go five minutes, raise your hand. <laughs> Will you do that for me? <laughs> start. The, uh, <laughs> you know, you start talking and, and the subject is so important to all of us and you sometimes seem to go too long. But let me state the problem as I see it, and uh, the United States is the only country in the world without an energy plan. That's pretty sobering right there. I mean, can we be that unusual? Without an energy plan, you'd think we had all the energy that we needed. We actually import more oil than anybody in the world. We import 13 million barrels a day, use 20 million barrels, give you a reference point, the Chinese use 10 and import five. They have their oil secured. We do not. 
So we're importing 13 million barrels, and five of it is what I want you to focus on tonight. The other eight million barrels comes from, I think, secure and safe places, friendly to us. Five of it comes from OPEC. And I'm convinced, as Jim Woolsey, who I know is connected, he been here, lectured here. I think so. Right, yeah, yep. Jim Woolsey. Both of us from Oklahoma, Jim and I. He's from the big city, I'm from the little town. <laughs> they, but Jim uh, and I talk about this frequently, had a, had a long discussion on it this morning, that the, uh, uh, that oil that is being paid for <coughs> primarily to the Saudis goes to the, to the country and then to the royal family and then to the Taliban. So we're paying for both sides of the war is what it comes out. And, you know, uh, that, that's just, it, it isn't smart, especially if you have resources that would cause you not to have to do that. And we do have those resources. Do we have the will to use them is the question. If you go at the problem, if you look at it for 40 years, the United States has never had a plan, never had an energy plan. Why did we get ourselves in a spot where we're importing two-thirds of our oil? And the two-thirds of the oil happens to be two-thirds of our trade deficit. So here we are in a, a very peculiar spot. And with the, with the Mideast in the turmoil they're in tonight and all, you don't know what you're going to see in the morning. Uh, I have a good friend that can't sleep very well, so he watches it all night. But uh, I get up, first thing I want to see in the morning, what's happened in one of the Mideast countries, because I have great concerns that the whole system could collapse, and 30 million barrels of oil comes from OPEC to the world. So we, if we have a solution, and I'm going to give that to you right now, if we have a solution, then we should start to seriously consider it and take action. The solution is get on your own resources. Do we have the resources? We are the largest <coughs> owner of natural gas reserves in the world. Because of the technology that's been developed in the last five years, that we, can, we, we have moved from in the pack up to number one ahead of Russia and Iran on natural gas reserves. Natural gas reserves, no question, is a hydrocarbon. But it is, it is the, the, the better end of the hydrocarbons. It's cleaner. For us, it's much cheaper. It's abundant, and it's ours. <clears throat> can we use it? We sure can. And I want to see natural gas go into transportation fuel. 70% <clears throat> of all the oil of all the oil used every day, 70% of the oil goes into transportation fuel. So if you're going to cut off, <clears throat> if you're going to cut off oil from what I consider to be the enemy, then go after transportation fuel. Five million barrels is what I'm after, which is the OPEC oil. <clears throat> so how do we do it? That natural gas, I would go after the heavy duty 18 wheelers, they individually use between 20 and 30,000 gallons of fuel a year. So go after the, the uh, 8 million 18 wheelers. There are 270 million vehicles in America. If this is successful, you'll go ahead and use it for other vehicles too. And that will all come naturally. But here you want a, the leadership to come forth, which is the President of the United States. And <clears throat> I tried very hard to get into the State of the Union that by executive order that all vehicles purchased in the future by the federal government would be on uh, domestic resources, not identifying anything, just domestic resources. And my second step was traction would come immediately because the world would see something has changed in America. They're going to, this is the first shoe to drop. Second shoe falls three, six months. And at that point, the president tells all of us Americans 
not Democrats, not Republicans, but Americans, that we must do this. He's going to also tell us at that point that at the nomination speech in Denver in July of 08, he said in 10 years we will not import any oil from the Mideast. He said that. That's a quote. Uh, he said it again in the fourth debate uh, with Bob Schieffer. Bob Schieffer and I had lunch the week before that debate, and he said, what energy question would you ask these two candidates uh, if you could ask? I said, ask them when we're going to quit oil, importing oil from the enemy. And he said, that's a little bit raw. I'm not, <laughs> not sure. But he did ask about imports, and Obama answered exactly verbatim as to what he had said at Denver in July of 08. Okay, can we do it? Back to the 18 wheelers. Yes. Legislation will be entered on April 7th, and that will be that, that, uh, to, that new vehicles would, uh, on 18 wheelers would go from diesel to natural gas. Another point, one MCF of natural gas equals seven gallons of diesel. One MCF of natural gas is four dollars. Seven gallons of diesel is twenty-five dollars. This is an opportunity that America cannot, cannot miss. If we miss this one, if we do not take advantage of this, I promise you, all of you, and me included, are going to go down as the dumbest crowd that ever came to town. <laughs> I'm serious. We will go down in history as the dumbest crowd. To have a resource that's cleaner, cheaper, abundant than ours, and we use dirty oil from the enemy. That's the way we're going to look. And it's, I'm serious about that. That's, that. That will be the analysis. So we're ready to go. That, that bill will be entered. <laughs> when will it be voted on? Not sure. But I think it'll happen before the summer recess. And I think that we will get it through the Senate. It'll be a standalone bill in the House. And I think it will, it will make it to the Senate, hopefully, with very, very few changes. I know you're sitting there saying Boone's a dreamer. I'm a geologist. You have to be a dreamer if you're a geologist. But I think we'll make it through this year. We will have an energy plan for America, but it is for America. It's for all of us. But you have a responsibility in this. I didn't finish what the second shoe was, I don't think. That the second shoe is that the president, when he tells us that this is his plan to fix his commitment to us in July of 08, is that this is the way we get off OPEC oil. We've taken care of the trucks. Now we're going to take care of, of the individual cars. That all of us, as Americans, patriotic Americans, the next car you buy will be on domestic fuel. It will be on domestic fuel. If that happens, that's where we educate America on energy, and that is today the missing link. America is not, has not been educated on energy, including Washington. They do not understand, but they haven't focused because a crisis, whatever crisis that has arisen, has not hung around long enough to cause the focus to be where they did get acquainted with energy at the level we should all be. But that will happen. I had five kids, and uh, uh, five kids, you know, at dinner at night can be a mess or it can be uh, a learning experience, or it can be whatever else. There's a crisis every night. But anyway, the, that I would, to, if I was, had five kids at home, that I would assign all of them a, I'd say, look, this is what the president asked us to do. It's patriotic. He wants us to use domestic fuel, and he wants us to pick clean fuel. So let's do that as a group, and in six months, we're going to go buy a new car, all of us together. That'll usually get a kid's interest if they think they're going to be a part of buying a new car. <laughs> so that holds them in. Uh, clean they like, but now, but what will come from that, there will be a great education in America on energy. And better understood, when those kids go out and have their families and all, that could, you may find in place, that they never bought anything in the future other than a domestic fuel, a car that was on domestic fuel. Not talking about a domestic car. You don't have to buy uh, that, 
just your on domestic fuel. Now tonight, if you want to go out and shop for a new natural gas passenger car, you know how many choices you have? One. Oh. Honda GX Civic. That'll get it. Honda GX Civic. In Paris tonight, if you were there and went out shopping for a passion car, you'd have a choice of 41. Wow. So there are 12 million vehicles in the world today that are on natural gas. In the United States, there's 134,000. We don't look very smart. That's my five minutes, isn't it? <laughs> All right, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions to kick things off, but I invite people in the audience to come up. Because the Gordon Grand is primarily designed to have students interact with leaders, I'm going to give priority at the mics to uh, undergraduates and graduate students, uh, uh, but we'll then turn on to a larger audience if needed. So let me start, and but please start coming up to the mics and don't be shy. Are the major U.S. oil companies, people like Exxon, Chevron, Conoco, Phillips, are they fully behind the plant? And if so, how come they don't seem to be more visible? How can they what? How come they're not more visible? I don't, I don't see them behind the plant. I think I can answer that with one sentence. Eighty-four percent of Exxon's revenues come from offshore. Yeah. Exxon is an international company. Are they bad guys? No, they're not. They're friends of mine. But they're, they are international, and they look after their shareholders. So no, they're not. They're not jumping up and down for my plan because they're selling foreign oil. Oh, you've got a huge line already, so okay. maybe we'll start right up. Okay. Did I, did I fully answer the question? I think so. Uh, it, it, I think it's more in their best interest than they realize oh. because they're going to lose those international supplies, mm -hmm. but they don't quite get that yet. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Pickens. <laughs> uh, I have, uh, basically, it's a two-part question, but it's very short. I know people hate two-part questions. The first part, um, what is the role for electrification uh, in your plan? Is, do you see a role for electrifying vehicles and, and getting vehicles more integrated with the electric grid? And second, if we're going to be um, moving to natural gas, what is to stop us in five or ten years from importing our natural gas from the Middle East the way, we are, the way many countries already do? I mean, a lot of countries in the Middle East are building liquid natural gas terminals, we're, we're already building many of them in the east and west coasts. So what's to stop us from being dependent 10 years on that? Are you ready? I'm sorry? Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, I want to be sure you, you're finished with it. The electric vehicle, uh, it's early. Uh, will it work? Sure, it'll work. Uh, I'm for anything American. Anything American goes with me, even ethanol. Okay. <laughs> it's an ugly baby, but it's our baby. But it, it's, ethanol will work, and it'll beat OPEC oil. Okay, but electric, sure, electric works. Light duty will go to electric is the way it'll go. And the final answer, the final answer, uh, that sounds a little too final, but I won't see this conclusion, I don't think, but I may see it unfolding. But you're going to use the natural gas to bridge you 20, 30 years out and then you will be to the next generation and it won't be hydrocarbons is the way it'll go. Second question was... Are we going to end up being dependent oh, on... Oh yeah, that we have, because of technology developed in our industry in the United States, we have a 200 year supply of natural gas now. Now that'll go down, of course, if you switch it over to transportation fuel. But you have, you're, you're safe for 100 years. But all you need is 50 and you got it covered. So it's, yeah, we have plenty of natural gas. We're okay on that. But I'm not saying that natural gas is going to be for everybody. That's, you want, what you want to do is study the question and figure out what is the best domestic fuel for you. Why don't we go to this side now? Hi. Um, you kept repeating that natural gas is a clean and abundant fuel choice. Um, can you address the environmental risk of natural gas extraction, especially hydrofracking? And is that environmental risk a good trade-off for um, decreasing our dependence on foreign oil? Tell me, if I could ask you a question, that's very, uh, I think, unfriendly to a answer a question with a question, but tell me your concerns about hydrofracking. Um, they use toxic chemicals in the process. It pollutes our drinking water because most of the natural gas is located um, 
right by the, the drinking water aquifers, especially in the Northeast and areas like Colorado. Um, it's basically the drinking water that's the biggest problem because we're okay. obviously dependent on that. The, I do not know of any, uh, any problem with a, with a freshwater aquifer being damaged by a hydrofracking. Now, I personally have fracked over 3,000 wells, and the first one I fracked was 1957. And uh, so hydrofracking is uh, uh, the aquifer, uh, most freshwater aquifers are 1,000 feet or less. Right. And the fracking that takes place is at 10,000 feet or deeper. Uh, that's way too much overburden to get frack fluids up and into the aquifer. You, there's not a way to get it there. Now, what they're starting to do, and I think most operators are doing, is they're using a closed system. So they're pumping down fracking, flowing back into the system. It loops, and there's no escape of water or frack fluids out of it. And I think over time that you're going to see that, that these questions are all answered, and everybody's going to be satisfied that hydrofracking is not dangerous to an aquifer. Do you think that using all of that water to extract the natural gas is a waste of another natural resource that we should be protecting? You're talking about an insignificant amount of water. It's, uh, you frack a well with 100,000 to 200,000 barrels of water, and that that's, is honestly insignificant. In the aquifer that I live in, and I'm in the largest aquifer in North America, which is the Ogallala, and our ranch is in Roberts County, that that aquifer is uh, uh, 200,000 barrels of water is insignificant. They extract out of there for irrigation every year six million acre feet of water, so it's not a it's not a problem. Thank you. Um, opponents of uh, renewable sources such as wind and solar often. Um, sort of point to the variability in the sense that the, the, you know, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, um, to, to make the argument that those can never be large sources of the energy mix in the U.S. Um, I was interested in your thoughts on sort of those um, suspicions, and then secondarily, your thoughts about domestic nuclear power and the future of that in the mix. Quick on nuclear, you're going to have to use it, and it's uh, unfortunate the accident in Japan, but obvious you should not have built the reactors on the fault. <laughs> I, I think everybody sees that now and, and what will happen is they'll move them inland and away from faults. Uh, San Clemente in California is built on a fault, that nuclear reactor is. So those, you know, you're going to learn by those, those situations, but you're going to need, you are, your age, you're going to all need all the energy you can develop is what's going to happen. You need to understand what you're going to deal with because you, in your lifetime, you're going to see a huge energy change. You're on the edge of a change in energy around the world. And it's, the reason is you know what you had on nuclear. You know that it works and all. But what you didn't know is all the shale gas that has been developed in the last five years. It's everywhere. You've got it in Poland, you've got it in Germany, you've got it in Alaska, you've got it in Canada. You've got it any place that you've been producing oil, you're going to have shale gas because that is the source rock that feeds the oil into the sands and carbonates. So it's got, you're going to have to deal with it, you have to understand it and all, but it is, all of this is going to happen. Did I get the answer or there's something else to the question? Uh, solar and wind period. Oh, the renewables. You, it's part of the mix. You've got to have it. No, the sun doesn't shine all the time, and the wind doesn't blow all the time. But what you do there, that's one thing else. We've never been tasked in this country to actually understand and design and put our energy portfolio together. What you need, and, and this is happening, but not fast enough, but the wind works. I'm in the wind business. I'm not in the solar business. But the wind and solar, you have to have backup power. Coal is not backup power for wind and solar because it's a baseload power. So what you have to have is natural gas. <clears throat> natural gas is, is the baseload, um, excuse me, is, the, is a backup for solar and wind because it can come on quickly and you can turn it off and on as the wind or sun acts. And it's, 
but it's nothing but design. It's not anything, uh, you know, that we can't handle uh, very easily. One, one add to that, that the, the highest cost <coughs> uh, power generation that you have is solar, and it costs you about uh, six thousand uh, dollars a kilowatt hour to build it. Fifty three hundred a kilowatt hour will get you nuclear. Five thousand, believe it or not, will get you coal. Coal has gone up dramatically in cost because they have to clean it up. Twenty four hundred dollars a kilowatt hour will get you wind, and fifteen hundred will get you natural gas. So you're going to naturally, once you look at what's available to you, you're going to look at the cheapest one first, and you're going to try to build in renewables with that. And you'll try to stay away from coal if you can, but you can. 52% of the power generated in the United States every day comes from coal, 23% from natural gas, and 20% uh, from, uh, from nuclear. And the rest is hydro and, and wind. So it's just get to know what we have available to us. Okay, question. Uh, Mr. Pickens, I just wanted to say, um, I like your plan a lot because there's been a lot of talk with what to do with energy in the future, and a lot of them are very long-range plans. Um, and yours is something that we could act on, as you said, very quickly. Um, one concern, though, that I wanted to ask you about is that I've noticed, especially in the past with energy, one of the problems you have with business is, um, for instance, with oil, it's, it's a very profitable energy source and it seemed very abundant. So there really wasn't a lot of uh, investment in future technologies, and a lot of money was reinvested in extraction and processing. So uh, does, your, does your plan account for uh, investing some of the money that comes from the natural gas and use it to research newer technologies to sort no. of bridge the gap? I, do, I don't, uh, I, I think that all takes care of itself. Okay. I, I don't see how I do that. I don't see how I take money out of natural gas and tell them they've got to, uh, they've got to give me the final product. I think that, I, you know, I'm such a free market person and I hate to go to the government for anything. I just, uh, I, I testified for a uh, congressional committee and I said I've never been, and this was 20 years ago, I said I've never been to Washington and gone to the government, ask them for anything. And immediately the first guy that that got the floor oh, was Jimmy, John, Jimmy Jones from Oklahoma, a Northeast District Congressman. <clears throat> he said, you were in my office asking me for something yesterday. I said, no, I was there asking you not to do something to me. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I see Jimmy now, he says, not to do something to you. I said, that's <laughs> right, Jimmy. But no, I don't, I don't want to go to the government to, and I, so I don't want it put back in. Would I be opposed to that? No, I would not be opposed to it. I think the idea is sound. The money, some money could do that, but I think you're going to have money that will go in that direction is what will happen. If I could just clarify one thing, would that be okay? Um, so I, I also am more of a free market person. I, I wouldn't want to see the government sort of impose that by, by uh, fiat, but um, how do you, do you see businesses doing this on their own? Do you think perhaps tax credits or other incentives are appropriate, or do you think that this is something that's going to be completely uh, taken care of by business leaders. I, I, the, anytime you say, is it going to be taken care of by business leaders, I mean, there are selfish motives in business leaders. We all know that. And uh, that's the subject we were on earlier today, the, the structure of a corporation and why it's there and everything else. And the, uh, no, I wouldn't want to say that business leaders, I wouldn't want to put it all in. I, w I wouldn't want to count on them for everything, but I believe that, that the markets will uh, take you in that direction, and you're going to have time. You're going to have time to, to have a plan. We don't have a plan. We have no plan. It, it's the most incredible thing I've ever seen in my life, that you have the largest transfer of wealth in the history of mankind going from us to people for their oil. It's incredible. And we have no plan. Nobody sits down and says, how long can we continue to do this? I've never heard anybody say that. And so we have to have a plan. I think the things you talk about would be discussed in that plan. Thank you.
Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could comment about some of the uh, hurdles to implementing your plan uh, that would be posed by the uh, path dependencies and network dependencies on our current reliance on oil in the transportation sector as evidenced by just sort of historical trends and also the infrastructure that would need to change to make that happen. Um, and then while discussing that, uh, what's the differentiated roles between the public and private sector in unrolling um, that change in infrastructure that will need to happen to overcome those path dependencies? Okay, we're speaking, the infra infrastructure question is what I'm getting, is that right? Okay. Well, I mean, the things you said were important, of course, but, uh, but that's what you're, uh, how do we get the infrastructure? And that comes, that comes. Again, I go to model. I've said several things today several times, so I may, I may say the same thing I said to you to somebody else, or I may say it to you twice. So if I do, don't laugh. Okay. <laughs> All right. That the that but uh, the infrastructure will come with equipment, and I don't use R and D. Have I said this? No. Yeah, I don't use R and D because R takes ten years and D takes ten years, and that puts me out of the money. So I'm eighty-two. 10, 10, 102, okay, nobody laughed, I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> Scratch that from the notes, what I speak from. The, uh, but the, uh, uh, here, uh, we have the model almost for everything we want already has happened in California. California has had to deal with this problem for years that, uh, because of air quality. So when they got all through, they tried a lot of answers. They came down to natural gas. LAX, uh, LAX, LAMTA is the largest bus fleet in the United States. 2,800 uh, buses on natural gas have been for 20 years. It, it cleaned up uh, uh, smog in Los Angeles. That was a big part of the cleanup. Today, they are cleaning up the port of Los Angeles, Long Beach, because they, there's, on the study they made, 3,500 people a year die in that area because of air quality. And they got a guy in there that's a, a tough, hard-nosed, uh, uh, green guy. His name's Dave Freeman. And Freeman went to natural gas for 18,000, uh, uh, 18, for 16,000 18 wheelers in the port. They've gotten about 20% of them done. So you've got You've got the answer. Now, how did you fuel these vehicles? People make money off of it. I mean, it's, the fueling business is a business. When I took the plan to Harry Reid, who's majority leader in the Senate, uh, that he told me after his people analyzed it, he said, what you're doing creates more jobs than anything that's crossed my desk. It creates more. Our deal came up with 1,300,000 jobs is what it was for everything. Trucks, fueling, the whole work. McKenzie and company looked at it and said, if your assumptions are correct, your conclusions are accurate. And that's it. But it, what I'm talking about, the fueling will be there, infrastructure will come. Remember, I said I wanted the 18 wheelers. I didn't say I wanted your car. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, so, so where's the line between what uh, public sector regulation is needed versus how the markets will just run with it on their own? Because in the California example, you know, regulation certainly played a role in, uh, you know, uh, incentivizing the private sector, uh, you know, transition to natural gas. Well, they, of course, they forced it. Let me give you another uh, very good move on the part of California, Southern California. Uh, the Air, South Coast Air Quality Management District, the AQMD, uh, is powerful. They've got money and taxing authority, and they got a real smart guy running, a guy named Barry Wallerstein. Wallerstein had an air quality issue. He said, who are my biggest polluters? They said, trash trucks, trash trucks. They operate 24-7, do a lot, the, they idle a lot, and consequently had an inefficient burn. Take one of them off the road, and you take off 325 cars. Wow one diesel trash truck. He said, okay, what's the incremental difference in cost? 50000 Fine, we have plenty of money. Tell them the next one they buy is natural gas. We're not buying any more diesel. And we write them a check for 50000 Now, 75% of the trash trucks in Southern California are on natural gas. That program is seven years old. 
I think I can solve the 8 million, 18 wheelers. I think I can solve that in seven years. And if we do that, that's two and a half million barrels of oil a day, and we cut OPEC in half. Hey, how you doing today? Good. That's good. Um, I'm a, a solar electrician, and uh, in 2009, I personally installed about 10% of the residential market in Connecticut. And now, wait a minute, 10% of how much, though? Of the entire residential market in the state. In the state? Yeah. Um, is that, tell me how big that market is. We did, uh, the company I worked for did about, a, had about a third of the contracts, and they had three trucks, so it's actually one-ninth. So can you give us a number, though, of how many homes that was, or whatever? One every week over the course of a year, so about 50. Okay. Um, needless to say, there's not a lot of solar projects going on. Uh, there isn't, but there will be. So, but uh, listen, I'm for you. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, you know, I want to help. I, I'm not I'm, trying to be a No, yeah, we're working together. I want to help you with your plan. Um, uh, well, why is it so expensive? If it's made out of silicon, aluminum, and glass, these are three of the most abundant uh, resources on the planet. Why are they so expensive? You know, you said it was the most expensive You're asking way. me. You know more about it than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, never, I don't know anything. I, I don't, well, we could make it a lot cheaper if we manufactured domestically, this, right? You want to do stuff domestically, right? I sure do. Right. The, but, I mean, you're getting most of that stuff from China, aren't you? Well, why don't we get it here? We should, we should manufacture here, okay. right? Wouldn't that lower costs? This is, a, this is a plan for you to have a business. Okay. Well, oh, I got a better one. How about this? <laughs> Offshore solar. Offshore solar. It would be like a barge. You'd have these series of barges, and they'd all have panels. So Listen, those cool. are all ideas. And, it, and is, the, has with them, thought of that yet? Yes, yes, you know, one out of ten is good. That's so, what will happen. And, but, you know, this is what will happen. This will cause discussion, and discussion will cause activity, and we'll solve the problem. Okay. But solar is part of the mix. It has to be. So, you sure it's not like a runaway train, the whole oil thing? I mean, can we slow it down? Can we change directions? Is that, is that Now, wait a minute. Possible? What's a runaway? A runaway train is like when, when you have this whole big industry and you're trying to get the, the automobile industry to start accepting natural gas and... and, and no, I'm not trying to get the automobile. No, no you, you missed. I'm not after that. We and, only get you know, this is a point. Questions. Okay, this is a worthwhile point. But no, I'm not... Listen, they're coming to me. The General Motors people, we talked uh, two weeks ago, and they came to see me, and I'm, I'm shocked. They're now talking about, you know... Uh, we're going to build uh, light-duty vehicles that are going to go for fleet operation and everything. And what they came to me for is, how do we fuel them? The same question we got, you know, 15 minutes ago. How do we fuel them? And I said, don't worry about it. I said, you got the fleet? The fleet? I mean, all they have to do is contract with the people that build the fueling, and it's all accomplished. I mean, like waste management. The first contract that we made, I don't want to get in a spot where I'm trying to sell you on my product, okay? I'm not trying to do that. But the first deal made was in Palm Springs, California. They had 60 trucks. They said, give us 15 of them. They said, okay. After a long discussion, 15 of them we got. It was just as soon as they replaced them, they replaced them with natural gas. Your deal, I mean, you have a plan, develop it, run off your cost, get you a spreadsheet, work it out. You may have something that will work, you know, very well. Okay. Hi, my name is Erin Gill. I'm a master's student at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Thanks for being here. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the contingency plan if the federal action that you've suggested fails to manifest, and specifically, what can local and state governments do while we either wait for national action or move ahead with your objectives if national action fails to come about? It's interesting, I mean, that, uh, and it, I don't know whether it's your generation, the difference that we are. I mean, you're thinking, how can we get the government uh, to help us with our deal, right? Yep. And I somehow, I don't go there, but I end up there. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not, it's not my first thought. Now, I got these, it was a Democrat governor's caucus or something in, where was it, Denver? Yeah, and we had... I don't know. Uh, I remember Bill Richardson was there, and then and, and, uh, I won't try to remember all the guys' names, but we're all there. And I said, look, you guys, they said, what can we do? And I said, just say that all vehicles purchased by your state will be on that, oh, not, no, wrong, 
domestic resource. Start out there and just put the pressure on your transportation people in the state. They're going to say, oh, hey, you know, do we have to do that? Yeah, you have to do it. That's it. But see, in, in New Delhi, and we talked about this at lunch today, in New Delhi, they're choking to death on diesel fumes. So the guy said, uh, uh, whoever, the, their leader there, whatever he is, he said, we're going to, no more diesel, and you all do whatever you want to, but there's no more diesel. So they went to natural gas, solved the problem. I said, how long did the did people complain? He said, oh, about six months, and then it was over with. So there's a little inconvenience. I met with the truckers, the 20 biggest truckers in the United States. It was the Saturday morning before the Super Bowl on Sunday, and they were all in, in Fort Worth for the game. Jimmy Haslam, who is, has pilot Flying J truck stops, he called me and he said, can you meet with these truckers, said, I got the 20 biggest truckers, and can you meet with them early Saturday morning? I said, sure, 3.30. <laughs> and he said, 3.30 what? And I said, you said early, 3.30's early. He said, no, I'm not talking. He said, why did you say that? And I said, man, you get the 20 biggest truckers, I'll meet with them anytime they want to meet. 3.30's <laughs> fine with me. He said, no, it's 7.30. I said, okay, well, I'll be there. I came and I told him, I said, listen, fellas, I said, you have got to be my leaders on this deal, the truckers do. When I say that, one of my biggest leaders has been AT&T, uh, Randall Stevenson, the CEO over there. I talked to him for one hour. Two weeks later, he called me up. He said, we're doing 10% of our 84,000 vehicles on uh, natural gas. <laughs> and uh, some of them, he, they did have some light duty on battery. But he said, we're going on domestic. And, but that's leadership when they, when they do that. Now, here I am before these 20 truckers. Kevin uh, Knight, Knight Trucking, you all have seen, they got thousands of trucks. Kevin Knight said, don't make us pay to be patriotic. And I said, I, I'm going to take care of it with a tax credit. And so not do that. But I said, I'm, I want you guys to not complain if you're inconvenienced. And uh, he said, okay. And uh, so we talked it out and everything. And this is all going to happen. I mean, those guys are going to be my Marines in this deal before it's over. And you'll see on the side of these trucks where it says, you know, domestic fuel, you know, or something on the side. I'm patriotic or something, which uh, I, want them, I want them to do that. And it, because they will lead, other people will see it. So what is that all about? And then they're moving in the direction. But I did get those governors, old Bill Richardson, he stood up and said, okay, uh, I'll, I'll tell my state all vehicles purchased in the future will be on domestic fuel. And, uh, and so it just, it, if you can just get these, you know, uh, <coughs> fingers out there into the thing and all is the key to it. And then the leadership shows up and everybody else says, you know, this all makes sense. And uh, so did I answer? You did. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pickens. You've mentioned a couple times today that you see uh, compressed natural gas as sort of a bridge fuel in terms of fueling, fueling our um, national automobile fleet. Um, um, you, you, you mentioned probably 20 to 30 years, but you've also talked about how, um, according to your numbers at least, we have something like 200 years worth of a supply of natural gas. So my question is, um, what do you see as replacing compressed nat natural gas as our national um, fuel source for our automobiles, and why, and why specifically within the next 20 to 30 years? I think that you will, uh, uh, I, had, I had this discussion with Al Gore, you know, Al's a very green guy, and I, I can pass the saliva test for being green, and, but Al Gore and I were talking at lunch. If you ever go to lunch with, uh, with Al, uh, he, he had a suite at the Regency Hotel in New York, and he said, come and have lunch with me, and I, he said, I said, okay, he said, I'll order for you, and uh, and I said, okay, I'll be there in 15 minutes. And he said, what do you want? And I said, whatever you eat, I'll eat. He said, okay, do it. It's not, it was not a bad call on my part. I got there, cheeseburger with fries. <laughs> I wouldn't order it, but I'd sure eat it. So anyway, we sat there, Al and I did, and he, we talked about this, and he, he's, uh, I said, he kept talking about the battery. I said, Al, a battery won't move an 18-wheeler. It, it won't do it. And he said, it won't. And I said, no. 
And so there that day, and when we concluded we shook hands on it, I'll be for light duty uh, battery if you're for heavy duty natural gas. And so the, the, the fuels uh, that, when you say what is it gonna be, if I had to guess, I'd say probably the battery is what it'll be. But watch out on the battery. We don't wanna find ourselves getting off of Saudi oil and ended up on a Chinese battery. I don't think that's smart. And so, but I don't see the Chinese as enemies. I do see that Saudi crowd. Listen, when you have 18 people on two airliners that hit two buildings in New York City from Saudi Arabia, that's not a coincidence. That's way too many from, from there. I, I, I'm an old man, and I've seen a lot of things, but, uh, you know, I've, uh, it, it's, I'm pretty hard to fool. Would you want to do one quick follow-up? Yeah. Um, so, so I guess my question then is, um, given, given that we have 200 years worth of natural gas and given that it's so much cheaper than anything else, why do you think that in 20 to 30 years we'll move on to presumably um, renewably sourced oh, battery it. power? It, with natural gas in abundance is yeah. what you're saying. We've got yeah. plenty. You probably won't. It, the only reason is because somehow, some, now no question natural gas will go up in price because go back and compare the one MCF natural gas, $4, is equal to seven gallons of diesel, which is $25. That's gonna close up, up that uh, uh, scale. It's gonna come up on that. So you might be able to come in there with a battery that's cheaper. It would be the only way it would do it. But it will, it will come down to which fuel is the cheapest at, if, it's, if both of them are abundant. Thank you so much for being here, Mr. Pickens. Thank um, you. Well, we, clearly there are issues in terms of pollution associated with the current petroleum technologies. I wondered if, given the difficulties of transitioning to different infrastructure, you saw a place for um, technologies, gas to liquid, converting natural gas to standard diesel fuel. Okay, you said the infrastructure question. So if you see that as a way to alleviate that, where you just instead of redoing the transportation fee, you build plants to convert natural gas to diesel fuel. That, we, that you build what? Convert, convert uh, natural gas to diesel as a way of jump-starting. Oh, uh, yeah, and, which you can do, yes. But that's more expensive. But you can take natural gas and, and, and go gas to liquids and, and come up with diesel fuel. But it's, you, it, it's, it's way cheaper to do it uh, and let it go. You'll be using natural gas in two ways. You'll be using it as compressed natural gas and you'll be using it as LNG, liquefied natural gas. And on the 18 wheelers, a lot of those will be on LNG. Thank you again, Mr. Pickens. I, I was actually fortunate enough once to have dinner with Mr. Gore briefly and had a very similar burger story, so uh, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. I think you really hit the nail on the head when you talked about education. Um, I really, uh, you know, agree with your analogy when you talked about, you know, a father or mother sitting at the table and talking to his, uh, his or her family about why we have this need to transition off of oil. But when you look at how deep set all of our economy is and how, you know, how much oil plays a role in every facet of our lives, until we have that change in consciousness, until we have the American public realizing this is a collective action that we have to take together, I'm skeptical that real change is going to occur. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more on that point of education what you think the most important or the most effective way to build a coalition of Americans together for this issue, and also what you've been doing personally uh, with trying to recruit perhaps energy leaders and people who are currently invested in the oil process to get on board as well. I, I'm not, I don't, you've left me, I don't know, understand the question. Oh, sorry. My question is what you think is the most effective uh, outreach, you, you mentioned education in terms of getting people okay. uh, to come together and also with the oil. Well, you see, I, I think I'm, I'm doing what I think is the most efficient way to do it. Yeah. I've got all of you together That's true. <laughs> to listen to me and I'll pick up a lot of support out of this room. Right. And there'll be, uh, you know, I want every one of you to sign up on pickensplan.com and that's got a million seven hundred thousand people signed up on it. So I'm, you know, I'm, I, I have a plan. Right. I've got to tell you where that came from. When I was in college, 
at Oklahoma State, and I was uh, initiated into fraternity that my father was, uh, belonged to the same fraternity I did that I was being initiated in. And he was a really a lot better fraternity man than I was. He, <laughs> well, he spent a lot more time loving it. He'd go on a campus. Uh, I remember we were at Lawrence, Kansas uh, for a football game, and we got on campus. He said, the first thing we need to do is go by the SAE house and see the brothers. I said, you serious? He said, yes, I'm serious. He goes over and sees everybody, talks to them. I didn't do that, but he, he was better than I was on it. But anyway, he pinned me that day, and the service was over, and we walked out on the front yard, and he said, uh, now it's going to get serious. And I said, what's that? And he said, your mother and I don't think you're on the same schedule to graduate that we're on. <laughs> I said, I may not be. And he said, you started out in veterinary medicine. Now you switched over to business. And he said, you don't seem to be serious about anything. And he said that, Son, he said, I can tell you, a fool with a plan can beat a genius with no plan. And then he, he looked, his eyes narrowed down, he said, your mother and I are concerned that we have a fool with no plan. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew it's serious, no kidding. And so we, we hugged each other and he left. But I, from that point on, I have consistently, I have always had a plan. I've had a plan. I know I've got a, something. I may change it. Sure. That's, that's okay. I've adjusted, and circumstances have changed and everything else, and I've changed. But I do start off with a plan. I end up with a plan. And I've got a plan to sell this. And I've gone, I mean, I've gone step by step. I've got the legislation working. I'm here talking to you. There couldn't be a more influential group than you all are that I can find and I'll find another one and I'll talk to them. I, I flew 609 hours on my airplane last year and I can tell you that's a lot of flying. And I, it, I had did, in two years I did 42 town hall meetings. And so I've tried. I, 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 I know the seriousness of the issue and somehow, you know, I, I think I got uh, stuck with the mission is what happened because nobody else was willing to take it on. I never served in the service, <clears throat> and that's unusual for our family because there are a lot of guys, a lot of my family members who did serve. I was a little bit young for World War II. Korea was my war, and I was married and had a child, and I was deferred, and Vietnam, I was too old for that. <clears throat> but I, I always, you know, I felt like someday I'm gonna get a mission. I think I've got one, I really believe that. Thank you for your plan. Sure. Uh, so we talked about um, solar and wind not always being a reliable source. What do you think the most promising um, sort of large-scale uh, energy storage um, plans are, like thermal star salts or? Um, how do we uh, store? Energy. How do we store yeah. energy like solar and electrical? What, what's the best storage? Yeah, you're talking about storing electricity. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't. I don't know. I, I know it. It's got to be solved. But right now, I don't know. I don't know how you do it. It's, and that's not my field, so I, I, can't, I can't give you much, much help. I know, of course, how you store oil, because, you know, you know what the SPR is, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We got six, 750 million barrels in that storage in the United States. And I don't want to see the president pull that out because of $4 gasoline. Please, don't do that. That oil is there for a much greater purpose than that. If we get in a real spot, 750 million barrels is going to come in handy, but not to try to, uh, to control the price of gasoline. I, I don't know the answer. Oh, well, then um, to sort of add a completely different question, instead of selling uh, act the actual gas from the uh, petroleum reserve, what do you think about just selling contracts instead? Why not? Sell selling futures instead? No, I'm talking about selling it for your car so it goes yeah. in, in a refinery. But in order to limit the price, the U.S. could just sell a bunch of futures. And oh, I see. Don't, don't fool with the SPR, but, but just go in the market and try yeah, yeah. Do you really want the government to get into the no, market? No, it's, it's just another proposal that I've heard. Yeah. No, I, 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 <laughs> I, don't, I don't like that answer. I can tell you if the government got into it, uh, uh, traders in the futures market are much smarter than government traders. <laughs> uh, it would be very expensive, whatever they did. 
Let's go here. Hi, Mr. Pickens. In a former life, I was a geologist, too. Uh, my question is, uh, a lot of people say that the best energy source that we have is the energy that we don't use. Do you have any thoughts on using technology like fuel cells, which can take the methane, convert it to hydrogen fuel, and run engines at a much, much higher efficiency uh, than combusting the, the, the natural gas itself? Um, and can be used for both stationary and transportation. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that kind of technology. Well, what you're talking about, I'm not familiar with, but I'll comment, though, is that that, that will work, I'm sure. You've looked at it, and it will work. What is the reason why it's not used now? It's because it's more expensive. They're expensive, but right. um, it, you know, it, it does have a lot of promise, and uh, it has about a 65% efficiency in an engine compared and to a traditional diesel engine of but all those things, I'm back to what I said an hour ago, all those things are going to be looked at and some of them are going to be used. But we're going to know a lot more about energy. And there's so much energy that we can conserve, it's incredible. I'm not kidding you. I grew up in a home in, in the Depression. And uh, that was a period back in <laughs> 1930. But I grew up in a home and I had a very frugal grandmother. And I, I got the message real quick. Sonny, if you walk out of that room again and leave that light on, next month I'm going to have you pay part of the electric bill. That gets your attention. I walk out of a room today, I cut off the lights. And that came when I was 10 years old. So we can, you cannot believe how much energy any home, I can promise you, you would not see one thing was less in your standard of living and you cut your energy cost by 10%. And that is huge if we all cut it 10%. That'll come, though. That'll be another program that will come at some point. I think we'll do one more question from, from the audience, and I have one final one for you. OK. okay. Thanks. So uh, this is in no way meant as a criticism of your plan, but I'm curious. Wait a minute. What is a criticism? Uh, it's, it's not a criticism, but I'm wondering. Um, it seems to me that if we were to suddenly stop importing OPEC oil tomorrow, that would, um, that would very quickly uh, be followed by other countries <coughs> buying, the, uh, buying the, that oil uh, mm -hmm. perhaps much, much more cheaply, but uh, you know, nevertheless, they'd be buying it. And it seems that it, they would quickly be, um, their infrastructure would be developed and they would be paying close to what we're paying now eventually. So I'm wondering. Now hold it right there. You know they can adjust that by supply. Sure. Oh, they do it all the time. That's what they do at OPEC meetings. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, and so they, they'll, they'll, they'll adjust as quick as you do. Sure, absolutely. But I'm just saying that they're going to find someone else to buy the oil if mm -hmm. we're not buying it. That's right. So I'm wondering, is there a part two to the Pickens plan that addresses the end game? The, well, so now well I thought I gave you the end game that, we, uh, that we're going uh, to get on our own resource. Sure, but are we going to export natural gas as well? I mean, I don't want China. To, I don't want to do that, but I'm afraid that's where you're heading, because you take the biggest uh, shale find to date is probably Horn River, British Columbia. That is already uh, deal is made. That's going to be transported to Kinemet, uh, BC, and out to China LNG to them, and the uh, this opens up another point I want to make, but that. I would like for that gas to come south, but we actually don't need it right now. But the, I would like to have a North American Energy Alliance. And from there, we would trade to control energy to ourselves. So, well, control, what are you trying to do? Well, let them control something, too. I mean, work with them on timber, work with them on something. But we don't have any deal makers is a problem. You don't have anybody can sit down and say, hey, look, we need this, you need that. Let's work together and work it out. But, but that doesn't happen, and so it, uh, uh, but I, I think I've given a, a uh, end game to what I'm talking about is to get on our own resources. We can do that. So, but it's an acceptable outcome in your mind that, that uh, say, the Chinese turn around and start buying, you know, the five million barrels a day that we're no longer buying from OPEC. Well, they're not going to buy the five million because they don't have to go to OPEC. See, they've... Uh, the Chinese have already reserved their oil. They, you know where they got their oil from, a part of it? We spent a trillion, five hundred billion dollars in Iraq, lost 5,000 people, had 31,000 injured, and guess who got the oil? Chinese. I went to the White House three times on this subject, 
And I said, look, they should want us to have the oil. They said, what price? I said, market price. You don't give them anything less than the market. So that nobody could complain if the Iraqi said, for what you've done for us, if you want to call on our oil, the United States, we will give that call to you at market price. I said, there'd be nobody in the world that would say, well, that's a bad deal. No, we would have gotten it. We never even asked for it. We didn't get it. So they put their oil fields up for bid, and Chinese get two of them, and Total gets a couple. We get nothing. We get nothing out of the deal, and we paid for all of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So my last question is on something else you have a passion about, not energy, but I just want to show everybody how broad you are, and that's about your beloved Oklahoma State football team. <laughs> Uh, that plays in the T. Boone Pickens Stadium. Now, last year they uh, won 11 games, which is pretty good, but they still got beat by Oklahoma, and they didn't win the Big 12. Is this the year coming up? Is this going to be the one? Let me tell you, I did not read up on this, and you've been so kind to ask the question and then uh, talk about our season last year because we never won 11 games before. But I remember Yale's, <laughs> and when I talked to your uh, uh, AD, Tom, last night at, over at the uh, lacrosse practice. And that uh, when we talked, I said, I remember Yale had two uh, Heisman winners. And I said, one of them was named Clint something, and the other was Larry Kelly. He said, Clint Frank. <laughs> I remembered that because my dad bought the first <clears throat> magazine on football that came out in a small town in Oklahoma. He had to order it. And I was the most popular kid in the neighborhood because everybody could come in and we could look at it together. <laughs> but I still remember those Yale players. I was 10 years old, 1938. And so I remember, are we gonna, uh, I'm not gonna uh, uh, get overconfident here, but uh, we have a very good football team. And I could, not, I could not believe it this year that our quarterback and our end, Justin Blackman, end and quarterback Brandon Whedon, came back and did not go in the draft. And th that, that, I think those guys want to win as bad as I do. <coughs> and No one uh, wants to win as bad as you do. Let me, but let me, let me have two minutes to conclude. Sure. But we were interviewed, the three of us were the other day on Oklahoma City Station. So here we sat, Justin and, and Brandon, and I was sitting in the middle. I said, fellas, that what really is great about this whole thing is that we rely on Texas football players at Oklahoma State. We have to have them. They, they, there are not enough football players in Oklahoma. But I said, Justin, you are from Ardmore, where my grandfather was a Methodist minister, and that's Oklahoma. And I said, Brandon, you're from Edmond, and I'm from Holdenville. I said, I like those Texas players, but I said, you're the quarterback, you're the receiver, and I'm the guy that pays for everything. <laughs> so I, I said, so we're, we're very important. And Justin said, is your grandfather a minister at the Methodist Church there now? I said, no, Justin, that was 70 years ago. <laughs> I want to thank T. Boone Pickens for an amazing sure. talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. That's fun. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank that was, you. That was fabulous. Thank you Good. so much. Good. Okay. Sign up with me on pickensplan.com, please.